Good morning, class. Happy Tuesday. Glad you came back for another day of language arts um, from the comfort of your home, of course. Didn't really have to come in anywhere. But hey, you are at least present digitally. Um, I asked you to read A.E. Hausman's When I Was One and Twenty for today, which I hope you just thought was a fabulous poem and you've been snapping your fingers to it all day long, um, which is relevant to our discussion today because we're actually going to discuss uh, meter. And again, I'm going to ask you to take notes of some sort as you continue um, to follow along with these lessons, simply to keep your mind engaged. So you're not just watching YouTube videos of your teacher talking, um, but you actually are writing down something, um, mainly the things that I've written down for you on the slide, um, because that's what I think is important. But it's also important for you to actually go through the process of writing it rather than just looking at it and reading it. I'm going to read this poem one more time, and then I'll talk about meter, uh, which is the main topic. A tough topic, but a really important one that, that really pays off later down the road. So this is When I Was One and Twenty by A.E. Hausman. When I was young and young, when I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, The heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs a plenty and sold for endless rue. And I am twenty, two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true. Lovely. Um, <clears throat> of course, this is a poem about uh, being young and in love and not wanting to hear some old sad man's advice about to protect your, yourself from falling in love, which is classic, right? It's, it's, it's something that you read about in the stories, um, that young people are just going to follow their heart. That's kind of how it works. Um, it's always been that way and probably always will be. And so when this old wise man is saying, look, be generous with your money, but don't give your heart away. Don't You got to hold on to that. Keep it safe. Don't give it to someone else. Um, then the poet says, I'm 21. Don't talk to me like I'm some old man looking for your advice. I'm in love. I'm going to go, I'm going to give my heart away all day. <laughs> Turns out the next stanza, remember that poems are uh, aligned in stanzas and stanzas are groups of lines. This poem has two stanzas. The next stanza, he's 22. Well, first he's 21 and he gets a second little poem, a second little saying said to him. But at the end, he's 22. And it's a, it, the, first, the, second, um, the second lesson that he's given by the wise old man is pretty similar to the first one, but it's a little bit different. The heart out of the bosom, the heart out of the chest is what that means, was never given away in vain. Now it sounds like he's on the side of the young man saying, just give your heart away, right? But it says that the heart that you give away is paid for. Uh, with size a plenty, size a plenty. Size is not a positive thing in this poem. Size refers to the heartache size. Oh, I'm in the depths. I'm feeling this pain. Right, that's what the size a plenty represent. Sold for endless rue. Rue. It's probably a new word for you. Rue can mean a baby kangaroo, but that's irrelevant. Rue is regret. Regret for what you've you've given yourself over to. So probably in this case, regret for falling in love with that person. Um, and now that he's 22 and he's probably been broken up with or something, that seems to be a theme of our poems. Uh, now that he is older, he sees 
that the old man was right. But uh, still, it's different than the guy that was in the first stanza that was 21 and felt on top of the world. Um, now he understands. Now he's learned his lesson in just two short paragraphs or stanzas. So that's a fun, it's, it's not supposed to be a crying poem. It's supposed to be quick. And like I said before, kind of snappy and, and how this guy's no use to talk to me. He's very cocky at the first stanza. And then he has the second, um, second look at the, the matter where he's more on board with what this old man has to say and actually making a poem out of it and sharing it with the world. Okay. Sorry, allergies. My eyes are itching. But now let's talk about something a little more technical. That is um, how the meter works. Uh, let's review from from last time. We said it's like um, poems oftentimes have a rhythm, like music. I want to make sure this is in presentation mode so you can see it. There we go. And think about in music when you have um, a 4-4 four, four time signature or something different. Um, all of that means that there's a beat and you're supposed to hold on to the beat and find it in your line and in your music. And sometimes the notes are different. Sometimes an eighth note gets a beat. Something like that. Um, same thing with poems. We just call them feet. <laughs> feet and lines rather than beats and measure. Uh, so let's talk more closely about that though. I'm going to go over some basics because maybe you don't know these and maybe you do. Um, but each word can be broken up into syllables. Um, I have a ukulele over there. So how would you pronounce that? ukulele. Now let's break it down into its syllables. Ukulele. Or as the Hawaiians say, ukulele. Ukulele. So there's four, right? How about uh, the word book? Book. That's a one-syllable word. Uh, let's do another one. Cell phone. Cell phone. That's two. Uh, anything we could do for like five syllables? Probably not around here. Uh, yeah, let's leave it. Um, so that's syllables. And when we have multiple syllable words, or even a, a string of one syllable words, we put the emphasis on certain syllables rather than others. It's just how we talk. Um, so let's think of another example. When we say rocking chair, we put the syllable on the first one, rock in chair, and then in chair kind of fades in the back. Um, let's think of this title, the hiding place, hiding place, hiding, hi, it, that, that syllable is emphasized. We do it all the time and we don't even think about it. Um, sweatshirt, sweat is the syl the stressed syllable, and then shirt is the unstressed syllable. So we stress one, we, which just means we emphasize it, and then we don't stress other ones, um, and that's okay. It just is always changing in how we speak. But the stress the stress syllable is actually within the word itself. It doesn't it doesn't have to do with you deciding which one is stressed and which one you want to stress, um, you just naturally know where they go if you speak the language. Um, <clears throat> so like if I said this, you're putting the wrong emphasis on the, you're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllables. Sounds ridiculous, right? The wrong emphasis on the wrong syllables. Like that, we know that it's supposed to be the wrong emphasis, sorry, the right emphasis on the wrong syllables or something like that. <clears throat> um, they naturally have that quality to them. So you can catch when it's, when it's wrong. 
I'll try to explain this in future lessons as well to review because it's a hard concept. Um, but that's what syllables are about. Let's move on. Um, what are the patterns of stress and unstressed in, in poetry? Because there are patterns. Poets have to specifically find the meter, meaning find that rhythm, that beat, in the way that they're arranging their lines. And they do this very intentionally. Um, there's, this is some new vocab, so just bear with me. Might want to write it down. You have, there's plenty of them, but we'll just talk about two. So IMs is a type of beat or foot that um, goes from unstressed to stressed. So instead of saying unstressed, stressed, an uh, easier way to think about this is to just tap it out with the rhythm ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. See how I wrote that down there? Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. <clears throat> the ba, meaning the unstressed, and the dum, meaning the stressed, like a drum beat. Ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. That's how you can catch an I am. An I am is a poetic foot, which is like a beat in music. Um, it's a rhythm that the poem will stick to. In, and when it, when it sticks to that rhythm, it means it's placing the stress syllables in a very specific place. This is tough stuff, but I think it'll be easier when we look at it through a poem. So now that we've learned the I am beat, the iambic beat, Let's read that poem again, tapping our chest. When I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. And so on. Notice that the beat is in the syllables of the words themselves. Hausman, our poet, has really carefully arranged his words so that the syllables fall in the right place in that pattern that we just tapped out. Isn't that amazing, seventh graders? I hope you appreciate that because it's not an easy thing to do. The poem that we read yesterday with Billy Collins, it didn't have a meter, meaning the syllables were just all over the place. But Hausman is taking care to make sure that all his words are arranged so that the, um, the syllables come at the right place at the right time. Um, and you'll notice that I'm not just, you could, be, you could be thinking, oh, Mr. Anderson, you're just saying it that way. The, the words aren't actually that, the words don't actually have that quality. You're just saying them like that. Um, but I want to show you another poem that you are probably very familiar with. You probably say it every year, A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement Clark Moore. Twas the night before Christmas. Maybe it goes by that title in your house and you have a picture book. Um, <clears throat> this is not an iambic beat or foot. This is what we call an anapest foot. And instead of unstressed, stressed, an anapest is unstressed, unstressed, stressed. So instead of ba-dum, 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 we have ba-ba-dum, ba-ba-dum, ba-ba-dum. <laughs> and that does it, it's, it's easier to just tap it rather than say ba-ba-dum. But, <clears throat> but I, I'm going to tap it and you should listen to this beat because it's here. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. So you can hear it. Da da dun 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 da da dun. It's um if you have ever studied music, it would be a three a uh, um, a th what do they call it? Where it's in thirds, four three. It's like a waltz. Yeah, 
this isn't music class, so if you don't take music, that's fine, but it might help you. It's like a waltz where you have, you're counting in threes. So, there's different types of rhythms, that is, meters in different poems. That's the big idea today. And as we read more poems, I want you to be able to identify what those meters are. Um, so this one would be what we called anapest, anapestic, uh, whereas the first one that we read, the one we were focusing on when I was 1 in 20, this one is iams. It's an iams. Um, that is, it's an iambic meter. Um, so I hope that didn't confuse you. Although I'm guessing there's a few of you, your heads are spinning, you're saying, what is he doing? He's tapping, he's singing, he's reciting poetry, and he's talking about music. It's true that poetry is musical. And so when we read poetry, we have to think like musicians and be able to count out a certain beat and feel it when we say it. Now, when we're reciting poetry aloud or reading it for someone else, we don't usually want to be tapping to show them the meter because that doesn't sound good. But when we're studying it and not presenting it, then it's perfectly fine to tap it out and to try here where the rhythm is. So um, one last time before I close the video, um, we'll, we'll do the second stanza because we did the first one so many times. Can you hear the I am's, the unstressed and then stressed syllable over and over? When I was one and twenty, I heard, I heard him say again, the heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Was never, so then that, that word given was never, was never given in vain. He's doing a trick with you because given sounds like two syllables, given, but he's using it as one in his poem, and it, you just read past it. So you can say it with one syllable if you try, given, given, <laughs> um, but he's, so that's one tweak within his poem. Was never given in vain, tis paid with sighs of plenty, and sold for endless rue, and I am two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true. So there's the I am, the ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, over and over. Um, and it's really going to pay off if you can get your mind to understand what that means um, and how to catch that in a poem. So I would like you to respond to me with questions or saying, I need you to, to explain that again, Mr. Anderson, because you're talking in ways that I don't understand um, because this is probably new to you and I would love to clarify if you have certain questions and in future lessons because communication is everything during this uh, COVID-19 because there's the world's kind of separating us but we got to find ways to make learning happen by staying together and clearly communicating with each other. So, um, answer the question for today in the assignment tab, and you do not have homework besides that. Um, this is midterms now, so I would look at your educate to see, do I have my, all my daily lesson checks in, or do I need to go make up one that I missed out on before? I would also start thinking about your quarter four book project. Um, I'm going to open it up for any of the three options. Initially, our plan was to have you do one of each of the three options, right? Because you've done two of them already, so you have one left. Um, I'm going to let you choose to do any of the options. So if you've done the photo story before, but you wanted to do the photo story again, that's okay. Of course, because the circumstances have changed with our abilities to do these projects. So if you want to do option one, the book report, that's fine. If you want to do option two, photo story, that's fine. If you want to do the collage type uh, multimodal book report, 
you can do that one as well. You are welcome to do that. Um, so that is due May 19th. I pushed it back just a little bit. It was 15th before. Now we're going to do May 19th as our due date for that. It's a Monday, I believe. And it's towards the very end of school. So um, you have some time, but hey, it's April 28th. So that's going to come up sooner than later. And I would, I would start to think about your book project if you haven't done that yet. Um, I'll put another um, link to our instructions for that on the Teams page uh, if you need that. So, yep, that's what I got for you today. Um, let me know what you need help with with understanding poetic meter and how to count it. Get a start on your book project, and don't forget your weekly membean. All right. See you guys later.